Hello everybody! This video has been kindly sponsored by World of Warships. You'll see why as we progress through the main video itself, but in the first 90 seconds I'll just tell you a little bit about the game. As the name suggests, you can play multiple different warships from multiple different nations across the, roughly speaking, World War I and World War II periods. There are loads of historic designs present within the game, as well as quite a number that never actually saw any action because they were only ever drawn up on paper. But of course they're now all rendered in lovely 3D. There is even a dry dock or dockyard port that you can use so you can see the ships from all angles. There's a new graphics update coming soon and there's always new ships coming in as well. But particularly relevant to this video, you can of course command the mighty HMS Hood into action. So if you haven't picked up the game before, link to download it is in the description, and if you use the code WARSHIPS, you can get a big starter pack which gives you 500 doubloons, that's the premium currency, 2 million credits, that's your regular currency, 7 days of premium account time, and after you've played 15 battles, you also get a free ship. And of course, this being a game, if you want to take Hood up against Bismarck, except with a slightly more positive outcome for the British Battlecruiser this time, you can do so. So thanks to World of Warships, but now, well, let's answer the question, how did Hood get here? Much has been said about the end of the life of HMS Hood. How it happened, why it happened, what could have happened if it didn't happen, and so on and so forth. But perhaps a little less is known about the origins of HMS Hood. So that's what we're going to look at today. Now, the path of British battleship and battlecruiser design was surprisingly quite little affected by World War I although the construction side of things definitely was heavily affected. The battleships for financial year 1912-13 had been five of the Queen Elizabeth class, with a sixth, HMS Agincourt, ordered the following year, but never laid down due to the, due to the outbreak of the war. There are strong indications that Agincourt would have followed a modified design from the original Queen Elizabeth, although exactly what that was remains to be seen until someone digs up that, that particular cover from the archives. These ships, the QEs, were faster, more heavily armed, and more heavily armoured than their predecessors, the Iron Dukes, and their speed meant that the relatively short, admittedly, tradition of building four battleships and a battlecruiser each year was superseded for that year, largely in part thanks to Malaya paying for the fifth of the QEs, which was obviously then called Malaya. Financial year 1913-14 brought about the Revenge class, the cost of the Queen Elizabeths and questions about the usefulness of their intermediate speed, which was somewhere between that of the battle line at 21 knots, and the battle cruisers, which were anything between 26 knots and 28 knots, depending on the ship, had led to the design of what was essentially a reduced version of the Queen Elizabeths. Armed with the same main battery and fitted with a slightly improved armour layout, the Revengers were smaller mostly on account of their reduced power plant, which was also powered by a mix of oil and coal, and designed to get them moving at the standard battle line speed of 21 knots. But a last minute change by Admiral Fisher brought back pure oil firing, which brought them up to a true speed, when new, of about 23 knots, without much increase in cost, and eight vessels of this class were ordered. At first, there had been a desire to go back to the gun layout of the 13.5-inch armed ships with 10 guns, i.e. an amidships Q-turret as well, but there wasn't enough space to fit five twin 15-inch turrets on the reduced hull size of the Revengers, and increasing the size and thus cost of the ship to allow them to fit went directly against the idea of them being cheaper. Fitting triple turrets to the lower positions, similar to the US Nevada class, was briefly considered, but as there was no existing triple turret design, and with tensions escalating, the delay that would be needed to design one was not considered acceptable. Eight ships would be ordered in total, but the rapid degeneration of matters in early 1914, followed by the outbreak of actual war, meant that the last three, Resistance, Renown and Repulse, were cancelled, along with Agincourt, as we mentioned earlier, since it was believed that the war would not last long enough to see these ships completed, and the resources and dockyard space would therefore be better spent building smaller ships, which might get into service faster, and repairing the inevitable combat damage to various vessels. This was, of course, a catastrophically bad estimate as far as how long World War I was going to last is concerned, and in the end materials for Renown and Repulse were repurposed to build a pair of swift battlecruisers that would go by the same names. 
Mid-1914 had of course been caught up with the outbreak of war, and late 1914 as well as early 1915 had seen the Royal Navy's capital ship design resources mainly concentrated on producing the aforementioned emergency battle cruisers, as well as some preliminary work on what would eventually become the Courageous class. That brings us up to late 1915, and as some of the Queen Elizabeths were now in service, along with all of the 13.5-inch armed ships, the next stage in British battleship design was due for consideration. The feedback from the new ships that had hit the water, plus early wartime experience, combined into a study that identified two linked problems with current British warships – excessive draft and insufficient freeboard. That the fleet was usually travelling full to the brim with fuel and with all sorts of additional things tacked on as the result of wartime modifications, uh, something that was obviously only going to get worse as the war continued, was making this issue even worse. Two primary concerns were raised by this. First, Above water, the reduction in freeboard was making life miserable for the crews of the ship's secondary batteries, as these were not watertight, and thus were being flooded out in all but the calmest of seas. On some ships, the very worst affected positions had just been plated over completely and the guns moved elsewhere entirely. This situation could of course mean that a ship in combat might have little practical firepower for use against smaller, fast-moving ships like destroyers, and in some cases even peer targets would be engaged with the secondary guns, but this required them to be operational. There was another, much broader concern as well. The leakiness of these batteries meant that the actual freeboard of the ships was reduced by a deck, which in turn significantly reduced the angle of heel that the ships could endure, without risking repeating the loss of the Mary Rose hundreds of years earlier. These issues were not unique to the Royal Navy, but they were being flagged up now within the Royal Navy as unacceptable going forward in future designs. Secondly, below the water, with mine and torpedo strikes now a much more common issue than it had been in the past, not only did a deeper draft mean more underwater area for such weapons to strike, especially if they might be running what otherwise would be considered somewhat deep, since they all had contact fuses, but when they did strike, Additional depth meant additional pressure of water, which meant that damage control was much more difficult and dangerous in the lower sections of the ship, even as water was flooding in faster than it would be if the breach was closer to the surface. There was also a small feedback loop of weight, since the bulkheads in the depths of the vessels with, say, a 33-foot draft would have to be built substantially stronger to withstand the additional pressure of water down there should a leak be sprung, and the additional strength meant additional weight, which would in turn mean that the ship sat slightly lower in the water still, which meant they needed to be stronger, etc, etc. There was another issue which was considered important, but a little less pressing than those big two problems. A ship's total reserve buoyancy is determined in large part by its freeboard, and in particular the citadel buoyancy, which in theory should be able to support the ship if all the unarmoured sections are flooded, is very strongly affected by the citadel's height above the waterline, since any part of the citadel that is below the waterline is, rather self-evidently, already displacing water and cannot displace any more. Thus, the Director of Naval Construction was issued instructions by the Third Sea Lord to take the armament, armour and engine power of the Queen Elizabeth as the standard and build round them a hull which should draw as little water as was considered practicable and safe and which should embody all the latest proposed protection and improvements against underwater attack. This was rapidly done, at least in sketch form, and by the 29th of November, a ship some 810 foot long and 104 foot wide had been sketched. This was over 160 foot longer and just over 13 feet wider than the original Queen Elizabeth, but with 22% less draft at 26 in foot 3 inches as compared to 33 foot 7 inches when at deep load. An additional benefit was that the altered hull form would, with the same power plant, likely hit something between 26.5 and 27 knots, which would actually make them faster than any of the early battle cruisers, and either as fast or at least within shouting distance of the more recent designs that were either just entering service or under construction. The secondary battery was moved up a deck 
or more in the case of a few guns, and would comprise a dozen guns of a new 5-inch type, although the 5-inch gun in the Royal Navy had yet to be developed. The main belt armour is listed as only 10 inches thick, although it's also listed as being equivalent to the Queen Elizabeth's end protection, which, given that the Queen Elizabeth's have a 13-inch vertical belt, seems a little bit odd, and likely indicates that there must be quite a significant inclination to the armour, although side-on sketches don't appear to have survived. Anti-torpedo bulges were incorporated into the ship's structure in a two-layer system. The outer layer was a series of air-filled voids designed to disperse the force of an underwater explosion, whilst the inner layer consisted of large steel tubes that were capped at both ends and arrayed five deep. These would in theory absorb any remaining energy via being crushed, and any that survived unbreached would contribute to the ship's buoyancy considerably more than a flooded or liquid-filled layer would, because obviously they would hold the ship up by their own buoyancy. At least so the theory went. But the design presented a number of problems in and of itself. The ship was so large that only three docks, one in Rosyth and two in Portsmouth, could accommodate the ship if it needed refit or repairs. Unless you wanted to use one of the larger floating docks, and you were prepared to have significant amounts of the bow and stern sticking out either end in the open air, which was dangerous at best, and uh, foolish at worst. Thus, considerable cost in upgrading a large number of home and overseas docking facilities would be required in addition to the build cost of the ships. Uh, with an eye on the only other major navy that was still developing and building new battleships at this point, the United States Navy, there was also a caution expressed that such a large vessel, with ostensibly the same fighting power as a Queen Elizabeth, might prompt the US Navy to design an equally large ship, which they could probably build faster and in greater numbers thanks to not being subject to wartime constraints, and which was likely, at least in the Royal Navy's opinion, to follow the older design ideas, i.e. have a deeper draft, and so use the extra deck space and volume to fit an even heavier main battery and armour setup than the Royal Navy was considering. There was also concern that the deck armour was quite thin on the design, averaging a total of about two to three inches over the vital parts of the ship, and this thickness was distributed over several different decks, which limited its effectiveness to less than the apparent total thickness. A note in December 1915 pointed out, long range, i.e. plunging, fire has improved, and consequently deck protection in addition to bulging seems necessary. As a result, a revised design was requested with generally similar principles, but with beam restricted to that of a Queen Elizabeth, as this would allow a number of narrower but still long dry docks to be used without modification, such as the one in Gibraltar. The original design was now designated Design A, and two new designs were prepared, although in the end only one of them, designated B, was submitted, as the other, whilst it retained the 27 knot top speed, also had a draft over 29 feet, which at this stage was sure to be rejected. Design B was 10 foot shorter than A, and went back to the 90 foot beam. Consequently, this gained about 3 foot in draft, putting it in the same ballpark as the later 12-inch armed dreadnoughts of the fleet. The armament and armour were the same, but speed dropped back to 25 knots. Experiments with the underwater protection layout suggested for Design A were being carried out in Chatham Dockyard on a mock-up bulge that was slightly thinner than the one that had actually been designed on A. This mock-up proved just about capable of stopping a torpedo that was loaded with 400 pounds of TNT, albeit only just. This indicated that Design A would be able to protect itself from the average German torpedo of the time, but the reduction in beam, and thus the reduction in depth, of the inbuilt bulges on B meant that it would not be likely to withstand such a blow. The Director of Naval Construction argued strongly that this drop in beam was thus unworkable, and the Admiralty Board agreed. Another round of design was called for. This would maintain the wider beam, but instead reduce the length of the ship, unlocking the use of the floating dry docks mentioned earlier in slightly more than absolute extreme circumstances. Two designs were sought, which would be labelled C1 and C2. C1 was to retain the full bulge protection found in design A, but with whatever length could be shaved off, 
resulting obviously in a loss in speed, whilst C2 was to be no longer than Queen Elizabeth, but with whatever bulge protection was possible on those dimensions. Recognising the length to breadth ratio was rapidly falling, it was allowed that speed might be reduced as far down as 22 knots, which was considered full battle line speed for the Grand Fleet with a little bit of a margin. C1 came in at 707 feet, just over 100 foot shorter than Design A, with displacement down to 27,600 tonnes from 31,000 tonnes in Design A and 29,500 tonnes in Design B. Draft was only three inches more than Design A, but of course speed had dropped by four to five knots and the secondary battery had been reduced from 12 to 10 guns. Main belt armour was the same, but with small amounts of armour shaved off from bulkheads, barbettes and deck armour. C2 was a mere 657 foot from the extremity of the bow to the extremity of the stern and came in only 25,250 tonnes, but draft was up to just over 28 feet, with the same reduction in speed, secondary battery and armour as found on C1. Both of these designs also only had a single submerged torpedo tube per side, whereas designs A and B had a pair. Neither of these seemed to be especially brilliant designs, and so they went back to design A as a basis, with yet another design, D, being asked for, which would retain the draft, the beam, the firepower and the protection in design A, but with the length reduced until its speed matched that of the Queen Elizabeth's. It was also decided to abandon the idea of a 5-inch gun, as most of the features desired from such a weapon, in particular good combinations of stopping power with easier-to-handle ammunition as compared to the 6-inch gun, had been found to exist in the 5.5-inch gun fitted to a pair of cruisers that had been under construction for Greece and then taken over by the Royal Navy at the outbreak of war, and thus the 5.5-inch was to be used as the secondary battery. Design D came back as 757 foot long and 29,850 tonnes. Speed was to be just over 25 knots with the full 12-gun secondary battery back in play and a 26.5 foot draft. It was now almost spring 1916, and someone had the brainwave that it might be a good idea to ask Admiral Jellicoe, the commander of the Grand Fleet, for his input on the next generation of capital ships that would in theory be assigned to him before they finished the final details of Design D. Jellicoe wrote back, pointing out a major flaw in the entire system of reasoning behind this series of designs. Since January 1912, Germany had laid down a grand total of four battleships, the Bayerns, none of which were yet commissioned. Britain, in contrast, had laid down no less than 14 in the same time, and as of February, all but four of these had entered service, with another two, Royal Oak and Royal Sovereign, being only months away from commission. This was in addition to the four battleships that they'd been building for foreign navies, which had been taken over at the start of the war, of which three, Agincourt, Erin and Canada, were also in service with the Grand Fleet. It could safely be said that the Grand Fleet was not exactly short of battleships. But Jellicoe was much more concerned about the state of the battlecruiser force. With Goeben stuck in the Black Sea, the Germans currently had five battlecruisers in the North Sea to the British ten. But six of the British ships were the Invincibles and the Indefatigables, which were only armoured against the gunfire that could be expected from armoured cruisers although their 12-inch guns could still hurt their enemies just as well as anything else. Moreover, the Germans were known to be completing the Hindenburg and at least two other battlecruisers. These days, we know that Hindenburg was the last of the Der Flinger class, armed with 12-inch guns, and the other two were the first of the Mackensons, armed with 350mm, or approximately speaking 13.8-inch guns, and capable of between 27 and 28 knots. However, the intelligence that was available to Jellicoe at the time suggested that all three of these ships were of a new class, the Mackensons, but that this class would be capable of around 30 knots, with a similar scale of armour to their predecessors of about 12 inches, and would be armed with guns of around 15.2 inches, or 386 millimetres, which is a slightly odd number from either the metric or the imperial system's perspective, but there you go, the intel reports were wrong anyway. Against these ships, all existing British battlecruisers would be underarmed, 
and too slow to either catch or escape the new German vessels. Renown and Repulse would, once completed, have the speed and firepower to fight them, but as planned they would have dramatically less armour, and the less said about the Courageous class and their chances in battle, the better. Therefore, Jellico directed that an intermediate speed battleship with somewhat questionable armour layouts was not particularly useful to him, and a new ship should either be very heavily armed and very heavily armoured, and thus be a 21 knot battle line unit, or it should be a 30 knot battle cruiser significantly superior to the Renowns, allowing it to match the new German ships. And ideally, Jellico wrote, the latter battle cruiser idea was his preference. He also directed a number of additional considerations which he would like to see. One, the ships should only have one mast, as a second mast would make it easier for an enemy to determine course and speed of the target. Two, if a larger gun than a 15 inch had been developed, then it should be fitted, and if one had not been developed, then design work on a new gun should start immediately. Three, ideally no fewer than eight guns should be fitted to allow for four gun half salvos, and make life for the fire control crew much easier than having to deal with the relative paucity of corrective data that could be supplied by six or even four main guns. Four, if a distributed armour scheme was to be used, the upper strikes needed to be significantly thicker than that which had been proposed on the current designs. It was also vital, in Jellicoe's opinion, to increase deck protection. Five, the funnels needed to have better protection to prevent loss of speed due to incidental splinter damage. 6. Whilst the reduction in draft was a good idea in principle, Jellico was prepared to accept a draft of anything up to 30 feet at deep displacement if this would substantially improve the fighting qualities of the ship elsewhere. 7. He would like it to be investigated if better subdivision and an increase in pumping capacity could mitigate a little bit against the need for such extensive bulges which had reduced the main armour protection and internal volume considerably in the battleship designs that he'd seen. 8. Minimal torpedo armament was needed, and these tubes should be in separate compartments in order to minimise flooding risks. 9. The main guns should have an increased maximum elevation, at least 25 and ideally 30 degrees, and the secondary guns should not be less than 12. That's number of guns, not elevation. And 10, the secondary battery should definitely remain mounted on the forecastle deck or higher. There were a number of minor observations on the details of armour layout as well, but they're not particularly relevant. This letter led to the abandonment of battleship designs for the moment, with two battlecruiser designs drafted up instead, and these were drawn up so quickly that they were finished on the same day as the ink dried on the final version of what was now the abortive Design D. Both battlecruiser designs, labelled 1 and 2, carried eight 15-inch guns in four twin turrets, with a dozen 5.5-inch secondaries and a pair of torpedo tubes, one per side. They both shared a beam of 104 feet, with eight inches of belt armour and a top speed of just over 30 knots but Design 1 was 885 feet long and weighed 39,000 tonnes, whilst Design 2 was 840 feet long and 35,500 tonnes. Draft on Design 2 was also a foot less than on Design 1, at 28.5 foot. Power output was exactly the same, 120,000 shaft horsepower. So what was the difference? Well, it was simply that Design 2 used small tube boilers, whilst Design 1 used the older large tube designs. Whilst small tube boilers did need more maintenance, the saving of a foot of draft, 3,500 tonnes of displacement, and 25 foot in length, and getting a top speed that was actually fractionally greater, were far too apparent of advantages to countenance retaining the older boiler design. Over the next couple of weeks, four more detailed plans were developed based on revising Design 2 in considerably more detail. Design 4 was a mere 757 foot long and 32,500 tonnes, as its armament was changed to four 18-inch guns, laid out like the Courageous class with a twin turret forward and another aft. Design 5 was 830 foot long, and 35,500 tonnes, armed with six 18-inch guns resembling an oversized Renown class. Design 6 
was 880 feet long, only five foot shorter than the large tube design one, and it displaced the most at 39,500 tons. It was armed with no less than eight 18 inch guns in four twin turrets, a pair super firing forward and a pair super firing aft. Design 3, meanwhile, came in at 860 foot long and carried a relatively pedestrian eight 15 inch guns in a similar two twin turrets forward, two twin turrets aft layout. It's 36,500 tons and additional length coming from uprating the power plant to enable the ship to hit 32 knots instead of around 30. It was also noted that Design 3 could be modified to carry six 18-inch guns like Design 5 at the cost of six inches in draft and half a knot or so in speed. The Admiralty decided that only Design 3 and 6 met Jellicoe's more specific requirements, and 6, the one with the eight 18-inch guns, would be more expensive, and it would also require significant time to develop an 18-inch 45 caliber gun, as the 18-inch 40 caliber weapon that was planned for HMS Furious was clearly a little bit too short-barreled for use as a practical ship-to-ship -ship weapon. And so Design 3 was selected, with two sub-options, 3A and 3B, having minor differences. B increased the torpedo tubes from 2 to 4, and the secondaries from 12 to 16. Uh, the latter in particular squared a circle of trying to maximise the secondary broadside, as with 12 guns, some of them had been planned to be mounted centreline on the shelter deck, which would have made for an exceptionally uncomfortable blast experience for anybody immediately below them, and would probably have reduced the ship's boats to smithereens every time they fired. Simply increasing the number of guns would allow the shelter deck guns to just be moved out to either side. Design 3B was thus progressed, and on the 7th of April 1916, orders for three ships were placed. HMS Hood was to be built at John Brown's on the Clyde, HMS Howe at Camel Laird in Birkenhead, HMS Rodney at Fairfields in Govan, and in July a fourth ship, HMS Anson, was ordered from Armstrong Whitworth in Elzec. The ship's protection consisted of an inclined 8-inch thick main belt, with 5-inch and 3-inch strakes installed above, with 2 to 2.5 two inches of deck armour at the maximum on the lower deck level. But in May 1916, the Battle of Jutland saw three British battlecruisers explode, and work came to a screaming halt whilst the potential causes of these losses were examined. A quickly modified design was prepared based on the preliminary findings in June. The 8-inch belt was made almost 2 foot taller, the 5-inch strake was reduced to 3 inches to compensate for this, the turret faces were upped to 15 inches thick and the turret roofs to 5 inches, and the barbette armour was made uniformly thick to its original maximum thickness of 9 inches. Extra anti-aircraft guns, electrical equipment, and a few minor bits of armour protection such as an inch of plating for the 5.5 inch ammunition handling areas was also included, which overall added 1,200 tonnes and 9 inches of draft to the ship. But by July, the Director of Naval Construction had thought some more, and suggested significantly more radical changes. The 8-inch belt should be 12-inch, the 3-inch strake should be 6-inch, the barbettes would go from 9 inches to 12 inches, and thus the ship would become a fast battleship with equal or better protection than a Queen Elizabeth, at the cost of a knot and two foot of draft off of Design 3B, leaving the ship capable of 31 knots with a 31 and a half foot draft, which was still two foot less than a Queen Elizabeth. The Admiralty approved of the idea, but the First Sea Lord also asked for the possibility of triple 15 inch turrets to be investigated. And this led to four designs. A, which was revised as previously to 40,600 tonnes. B, carried 12 guns in four triple turrets, displacing 43,100 tonnes with a 33 and a quarter foot draft. Design C, carried 10 guns in two triple and two twin turrets, Nevada style, on 41,700 tonnes and 32 and a quarter foot draft. And finally, Design D carried nine guns in three triple turrets, a pair super firing forward and one turret aft on 40,900 tonnes and a 31 and three quarter foot draft. Speed on the designs that had more guns than A also dropped by about half a knot. 
but since there had been delays enough already and the triple turret had yet to be developed, Design A was ordered to proceed in September. But even as the keel was being laid down again, Admiral Jellicoe stepped in with a few more changes. The upper strake was to be split. The armour from the forecastle deck to the upper deck went from 6 inches down to 5 inches, and the inch of armour removed was instead added to the lower part of the strake, which ran from the upper deck to the main deck and thus to the main belt. This area now became 7 inches thick instead of the previous 6. Deck armour on the upper deck was increased in thickness forward and spread out over a greater area aft, whilst the deck armour over the magazines was increased to 3 inches. Other areas of deck armour received minor increases, with the overall objective that a shell coming in at any angle up to 30 degrees would have to get through a cumulative minimum of 9 inches of armour above the main belt. This put the final specifications of Hood up to 41,200 tonnes displacement, with a deep draft of 31.5 foot and a design top speed of 31 knots. The main guns could, as Jellicoe had asked, elevate up to 30 degrees, although loading was only possible in the first 20 degrees of this elevation. Torpedo armament had settled on a pair of submerged torpedo tubes forward in line with the first main turret, and eight above water tubes mounted in pairs with one set sitting around the area of the mainmast and another pair just aft of the rear funnel, although in the end only the aft of these sets was fitted for reasons that we'll see in a moment. Also introduced was a small three inch strip of armour beneath the main belt that ran the length of the ship's boiler rooms. As the ship's construction continued, more changes were made. In 1917, the crown of the magazines was increased from 1 inch to 2 inches of plating by simply slapping another inch of plating over it, and in 1918, the main deck armour over the magazines was increased to 3 inches. To compensate for the weight gain, the funnel uptake armour was omitted, and the four aftmost 5.5 inch guns were deleted along with their equipment, reducing the secondary battery back down to 12 guns. In 1919, a new 15 inch shell was tested against a mock up of Hood's magazine protection, and at high angles of fall, it managed to get fragments into the cordite stores. As a result, the armour over the magazines was increased yet again, and this is what caused the deletion of the forward above water torpedo tubes before fitting out of the ship was completed, along with some armour from one of the torpedo control towers. This is why, in some earlier photos of Hood, you can actually see all four above water torpedo tubes on each side, although if you look closely you'll see that the forwardmost pair of doors is welded shut. By this stage, Hood was almost complete, and further changes such as placing the magazines below the shell rooms, increasing the turret roofs from 5 inches to 6 inches, reducing the size of the conning tower, moving the funnels close together, and various other similar alterations, could only be made to her three sisters, whose progress was not as advanced. Hood had been launched in August 1918, but fitting out took quite some time with all the changes, and she was not commissioned until May 1920, with speed trials in March of that year, shortly before acceptance, showing that despite the additional weight and draft that all the revisions had caused, she was actually capable of making just over 32 knots, a knot faster than her design speed. In part, thanks to her power plant generating an additional 7,000 shaft horsepower above its designed output, and in part thanks to excellent hull design. The trials also revealed a issue which would annoy the crew for the rest of the ship's career. The quarter deck aft tended to take on a lot of water. The freeboard here had never been that great, and that had been reduced by all the additional weight which had reduced her freeboard further, and then further still, when the ship was at speed, ships tend to settle aft as speed ramps up, and at higher speeds the third crest of her bow wave tended to peak around the aftmost main turret, which obviously further raised the relative water level often to about the level of the deck. Nonetheless, Hood would of course go on to see further refits and changes throughout her service career, and her three sisters were cancelled before she'd even commissioned, with the order to stop work going out in 1919, as these three were nowhere near as advanced in construction as Hood, and after the endless revisions it was held that a new design, Battlecruiser 1919, would be a better bet, although of course Battlecruiser 1919 wasn't built either, and nor were the G3s. And so it was that HMS Hood entered service as a class of one.
and would remain the largest warship in the world during the interwar period thanks to the naval treaty system, serving with the Royal Navy until she met her end at the Battle of the Denmark Strait in May 1941. But that, of course, is a story that we've already told. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.